welcome to Land in Action for this yet another chat with Dave Brown in part four of our discussion of uh, O Group, the rules, where we're going to take the opportunity this time to really burrow down and look at some of the specifics because we talked about the big picture issues, we talked about command and control and game setup, but here I think really we're kind of uh, heading into the nitty gritty detail of how movement works, how firing works, how close combat works and you know, how you win um, uh, in terms of how you, you know, how you defeat the enemy and drive them off. So this uh, in some ways is uh, the meat and potatoes of uh, the uh, uh, dish that we are serving up here. Um, but I wanted to talk to you generally, Dave, you know, I don't know about you, but when I'm done designing a set of rules, you tend to start out with a general big picture, overarching concept that you want to create as a, as a game designer. And when you were doing that, what, what, what was the, the, the overriding, design considerations that you had in mind? Um, well, the, the, the main consideration was simplicity. As we discussed before, the main focus on, on uh, for the rules design is that I wanted to focus the players' minds on command decisions and less on the minutiae of shooting and firing. Um, uh, just to, to use one example, it's I didn't want players to be making decisions about whether they're firing, say, from their tank, a HESH round or an APDS round. I wanted the thought process to be about commanding, deploying, uh, and pushing your troops forward, and less on uh, the actual mechanics of firing. So it was purely a core of uh, simplicity uh, that ran through that, that design thread. Okay, so um, I think it's important, really, isn't it, to consider that you know often when when war gamers come to playing a game, they're being asked to make command decisions at every level. You know uh, that the, the, they're not only commanding the battalion, but they're also manning that anti-tank gun, and it's it's important yeah. actually in order to allow them to focus on what they should be focusing on is to remove some of those choices at the lower level where they wouldn't be able to influence and, and accept the fact that decisions are being made at that level and, and people have got the skills and the drills to be able to make the, the pertinent decisions yeah. down there. Yeah. So that, that's, um, that's really emphasising the fact that, as we've discussed, that the rules are about commanding, the challenge of command and control. And so let us talk specifically um, about movement because we, we, you know, we've you we've deployed yeah. up to the table, we've seen how troops deploy we've seen them in the first of those uh, videos really where troops are moving about and one of the things that uh, that we saw in the video specifically when you moved up your your armor your reconnaissance armored cars you were talking there about a tactical bound and about how the fact they moved up to the point they wanted to move to rather than going the full distance because there's some um you, you're determining a lot of movement by rolling dice and things like that. So talk me through things like the idea of the tactical bound and, and then how movement fits in with that. Yeah, because it's it's uh, it also link, links into firing, isn't it? At the end of the day, you as a company commander or battalion commander uh, will give orders to units or you will have given orders and there's an expectation that they'll be they'll be carried out how the individual units then carry out those orders is actually not in your hands or, or the vast majority of it isn't you have some control but not a great deal um, so basically uh, once you give an order it's in the hands of the uh, local officers the junior officers and ncos uh, to either get their uh, units to move in the desired direction or to fire or to whatever. So therefore, with movement, uh, move up to that hedge or to that wall. That is your tactical bound where you are attempting to get to. And the dice will indicate how far that you go towards that tactical bound. And this uh, does basically two things. It makes... Um, the expectation of movement distance is a bit more realistic. 
in the fact is you're just not rolling the dice, hoping to go as far as you possibly can uh, in a certain area and then making a decision. The player will probably be going, right, what's the average I expect to get out of this platoon? And for all it to move rapidly, uh, perhaps it could, could go 10 inches, but a bog standard move might be only seven. So therefore, let's make the tactical bound uh, a realistic bound, if you like, where they are more likely to get to. And of course, that also is reflected in um, the various tactical manuals and it's still used today. When you're ordering an infantry section forward, you give them a, uh, a position to move to. So they will move up uh, to the hedge and, um, and lay down fire or, or whatever. Right, so they might not get to where you want them to get to, so it's uh, and how they perform really is out of your hands, which is true of any commander at that level. But you mentioned something in there. I have an option of sort of going extra fast uh, if you yeah. choose to do that. How does that work, Dave? There's two basic uh, uh, tactical movement speeds. Uh, one is um, your standard movement that allows you to, uh, to fire or to recon uh, as well. And that's basically just 2d6. Or you can sacrifice the firing and, and, go, and undertake what's called a rapid move, which right. basically means your chances of going further are, are enhanced by, by the extra dice. So you'd roll 3d6 in that situation, but wouldn't be able to fire. So, that's correct, yeah. Right. Okay, so nice and simple. So if your infantry are moving forward, they can go 2d6. If they then get into a position to engage the enemy, they can do so with fire or engage yeah. an, an enemy um, uh, patrol marker. Yes, uh, yeah. Which, uh, would be one of the options there. Uh, but if they're going extra fast, they, they can't do so. How do vehicles move, Dave? Are they... Um, uh, they're they're uh, basically exactly the same. They still get a tactical bound. Mm -hmm. And if they're moving tactically... Yeah. i.e. that is the, uh, with the um, ability to lay down fire before or after the move, mm. uh, they will also roll uh, 2d6, mm. but each vehicle type gets a, uh, an addition to that dice roll. Right, so give me an example, what would a Sherman tank, how would that move? So if you did a tactical move with the Sherman, mm. uh, you would roll your 2d6, but that would always add uh, an extra two inches uh, to that roll. And right. if you recall from the, the previous video, the armoured cars, because they're deemed as fast, they would always add an extra four inches. Right, so it's just allowing them to uh, have that little extra bit of speed, uh, yeah. which is pushing their average up. Okay, right, that's interesting. So uh, that's the way they move. How, how, do our, how do our patrols move, uh, Dave? The combat patrols, how do they move? They always move 2d6, Right, and you, you just take the result. Uh, again, I, it's not not in the hands of the company commander it's down to the probably the junior nco is in charge of that patrol right so they're there but they're moving 2d6 they're not able to fire i presume no right okay now um talk to me about um uh visibility uh because obviously combat patrols are part and parcel of that you <clears throat> you know yeah. that something's out there you're not sure what it is um how, how does visibility work? I mean, I presume you've got units that are spotted. Once a unit is spotted, everybody can see it, can they? Uh, yeah, there are basically there are four observation states. Right. So if a unit is on the table yeah. uh, and in line of sight of units, then it's spotted. Right. It's presumed right. that your troops will either uh, know it's there or, or know that enemy are in, are in that rough uh, area. Mm -hmm. um, however, one of the um, central themes to uh, shooting and spotting is uh, what we've mentioned before is the uh, the spotting dice right okay so, well, let's let, let me ask a specific question here because i yeah. think this is interesting in terms of a game mechanism this mm. isn't can i see that unit i roll my dice and then that tells me if i've spotted them and then if i have spotted them i can shoot at them but if i haven't i can't shoot at them this is actually a dice that is rolled when you're rolling to fire isn't it so it's yeah. telling you you're saying right i'm gonna i'm gonna shoot at that unit over there it's in the open 
you can see it so you don't have to roll the spotting dice at that point in time because you can see it but if you've got a target let's say lurking in some woods or uh, in a building and you're mm. firing at it you would roll the spotting dice at the same time as you would roll your firing dice i believe so let's say yes, you're rolling, right. let's say you're rolling four dice to spot you roll a fifth dice maybe green or purple or sky blue pink and yeah. that would and the result on that dice would then inform how effective the fire is. Am I correct in that? Yeah, that's right. There are, there are two points there. What I wanted to avoid was to have uh, in the design, in order to keep it simple, was to have two different roles before you even could shoot at something. Right. So well, I think we're all quite familiar, aren't we, in, with various war games rules where you have to roll to spot and then you have to roll to uh, actually fire at the target. Well, what I'm by rolling all the dice together, you're avoiding uh, coming out of the game, looking at a table, checking more modifiers, etc., uh, etc. Et and of course, what this spotting dice is representing is again the spotting's not in your hands as the company commander. Right. That is again down to the uh, the junior lieutenant or the corporals or sergeants, have they spotted the target or not? Right. And you as the commander will have to deal with the frustration of uh, ineffective fire mm. or, of course, the, the benefit of your troops laying down good fire because that decision's not in your hands. Now, you can, of course, order your men to fire again, mm. uh, as we've seen by using the uh, company commander order, that's your that's your element of control. You were going yeah. right. That fire was ineffective. Keep firing, but yeah. the actual spotting guy, that's not in your hands. Right. So when when I'm firing at the target that's in cover, I add in the the additional dice of a different colour. What do I need to to get a good effect? What do I need to get? It's it's dead simple. It's basically and there's a consistent here with with the rules is that um, a four or more. Mm -hmm. is a good result right. so in shooting it's a hit in spotting it's a spot and a one to three yeah. means you you haven't spotted the target which doesn't mean you're not putting fire down you are it just means that the fire is less effective right yeah. and and how how do you indicate how do you show that the fire is less effective what's the mechanism there Dave? It's, it's it's basically if you lay down um effective fire either target spotted yeah. then the defender or the target of that fire will take a morale test at his standard troop rating uh, number, whatever that is. It could be four or it could be five or, or whatever. Right. OK, so let's I think we need to I think we need to analyse this in a little bit more detail in terms of this morale test, because when you fire at a uh, an infantry target, you're yeah. actually not instantly uh, causing casualties on that unit are you uh, the no. effect is more initially one of uh, affecting their morale which affects their movement which affects their firing so how how does that work so if i'm firing at a, a platoon of your troops with three three bases three sections yeah so if you put uh, fire down again let's use your example so you fired with four dice mm -hmm. And, and you spotted me on the spotting dice. Yeah. And of those four dice, uh, a hit is on a four plus. Right. So let's say you get, um, you're lucky and you get three hits. Right. That means as the defender, I will then take three morale tests. Yeah. Uh, and each morale test, again, as you mentioned, it's the troop rating. And if I pass, there's no effect. If I fail, mm -hmm. I will receive and you might be familiar with this term, uh, Mr. Clark, mm. uh, one shock. Because okay. that is actually a very good uh, all-encompassing term to define kind of battlefield resilience and fatigue. Right. So, so for each hit yeah. uh, or, success, or successful hit, the morale test fail would generate one shock. So if I were unlucky enough mm. to fail all three rolls from your three lucky hits, yeah. Then I would be. I would take three shock, which would suppress my unit. And is that the whole platoon? The shock is counted against a platoon rather yes. than a section, right? Yeah. So, 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 so presumably, a unit with no shock 
can do whatever it wants. And how yeah. does it degrade from then then on down? Yeah, so a, a unit with no shock is of, is free to do as you wish, the commander, and it can shoot without uh, with any without any detriments. Right. Um, once you've taken one shock, yeah. you you're still able to you're still classed as steady. You can be given orders, but there's a, a slight detriment to your combat efficiency, which is firing in close combat. Right. Then once you've moved to two shock, you are pinned. Yeah. So you you can move uh, backwards, but what you cannot do is advance further towards the enemy, and you still fire with that slight detriment. Right. So basically, it it basically means until you've rallied off that shock, your platoon isn't going any further forwards. Right. And then, of course, the the last one is once you take three shock, mm. you are classed as as suppressed, and suppressed is that you are uh, in the dirt. Uh, lacking command and control, um, praying to God that you weren't in that particular situation. Mm. Uh, and that means that movement is uh, um, quite restricted and there's no fire until you manage to rally the off shock. Right, OK. Um, what happens if I've got a platoon on <clears throat> three shock? So they're there, they're suppressed, they're not very happy, they can't fire, they can't move. What happens if they get more shock? What happens if all four of my hits shots hit and yeah so what you're yes so mm -hmm. then there is a chance you will then take section losses that's how casualties are caused if you manage to inflict more shock and therefore more failed morale tests on the unit that's already suppressed mm -hmm. there's your chance to remove actual section bases from the unit okay that's interesting but i think the important thing that i'm taking out of this is that uh morale tests are actually a form of hit effect. So you're rolling a dice to see what the effect of that hit is. And in the initial phases, that damage is likely to be moral. But uh, as that uh, increases, we're going to see the damage being inflicted to the point where bases are actually removed from the section. Now, of course, some of that morale sapping effect is going to be people being killed, but it's just not at sufficient levels that we're starting to remove bases from the table. But once we're really getting those big hits in, that's the point where it's unavoidable. Bases have to be removed because losses are reaching those levels. OK, that's clear. Firing is very simple when I'm firing. So what would a typical platoon uh, fire with? If I've got a, a, a platoon of, let's say, British infantry, how many fire dice would they get, typically firing against your German platoon? Yeah, typically without uh, taking into account any of your usual battlefield modifiers, mm. uh, a, an infantry platoon will normally get about uh, six firepower dice, so that's six D6. Right, and if that's adjusted based on, you, you just hinted at that sort of battlefield conditions, so I'd, what, reduce that number if, if there were... Um, if I was firing at a target in cover, for example, or... yeah, that's right. I think it's all the it's all the usual things war gamers will be familiar with. They'll lose dice if they've moved and fired. They'll lose dice if they're firing at troops in cover or almost severe cover, such as bunker, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. Okay. But does it ever come to a point where I don't get to fire at all because I've moved? I'm firing at a bunker. I've got a teapot on my head or whatever. <laughs> uh, no, because. No one likes, as a war gamer, not to be able to fire at all. Right. So there's a universal rule in there that the minimum is always one dice. Right. Okay. So but it, always get a chance. It, it does mean that if I'm focused on just firing against the target in the open, it's going to be a lot more effective than if I'm moving and firing against the target in, in a battle. Yes, because uh, um, not only are there uh, probably going to be absolutely no modifiers, yeah. But there's also the fact there's no spotting dice because they're yeah. in the open. Yeah, and so. then we, we've got the, the double whammy that if I'm moving and firing against the target that's in, in some kind of cover, be it in buildings or in woods, I've also got to add the spotting dice into that. And that then doesn't affect the roll to hit. So that keeps it simple. I'm always hitting on that four, five and six. Yeah. But it means that they will rally that off and avoid the effects of shock more effectively because they're in cover. Is that correct? Yeah, so when they take their morale, no, their morale test, they're just they the target is saving on a on a, a lower roll. So 
and not only is the unit um, losing dice, it's similar um, to that if players are familiar with the Napoleonic general Dame with skirmishes. All right. Um, for the, the battlefield situation means that you simply remove dice from your overall uh, firepower. Okay, right. That's that's all clear, and that's nice and simple. Which, you know, we were talking about the importance in terms of game design of allowing people to focus on what matters, which is the you know thinking about what you're going to do, what you're going to do with your command and control assets, when you're going to use your company commanders mm -hmm. to influence the battle uh, at, at a lower level, um, uh, and it it creates a system of firing. That is very very intuitive it's you know, it's always four five and six to hit and then you just lose a number of dice which is consistent yes. depending on what you're what you're firing at so can you talk to me a bit about anti-tank fire because that was something we saw in the first video we had we had an anti a russian anti-tank gun firing at um uh firing at those german armored cars how how does that how is that undertaken yeah, anti-tank fire is slightly different in, in the fact that we use a, uh, a 2d6 system uh, to register a hit. Have I hit the target? And then simply, if you have managed to hit the target, you simply then uh, rate the gun's firepower against the um, target's armour value. Uh, and then there's a, uh, a dice roll to determine what the effect of that damage is, obviously modified by... Um, uh, either the gun or the armour, depending on the situation. Right, so the better the quality of the gun, the more likely it is to penetrate the armour. Um, yeah, absolutely. All, yeah. All, all very straightforward stuff. And you've got numerical values. So, for example, a, a, a 17-pounder Sherman would have a different strike to a 76 mil Sherman, which would have a different strike to a 75 mil Sherman. I presume this is all, you know, I don't think we really need to rehearse these arguments. It's that, that's, <laughs> yes. all, that's all reflected in there. Yeah, I it's, it's, yeah it's exactly so as, as one would expect a, uh, yeah. uh, an 88 millimeter flak or anti tank gun has a significantly higher AT factor uh, and range to that matter than, say, the small 37 millimeter uh, anti tank gun. It's okay. it's the it's the basic stuff that most again most war gamers are familiar with. So how would um, training uh, influence firing? Both if we were firing um, and, and troop quality, how would that influence firing? If we were firing at uh, better quality troops, were firing at a target, or if 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 the target was poorer quality. Um, one of the uh, main threads that runs through it is is obviously there's the difference between not only troop tra training in um, uh, tanks and, and infantry uh, but also kit so with um, armored fighting vehicles the tr the training and the kit is reflected by whether you're classed as a poor afv or or not mm -hmm. and poor fvs basically find it harder to spot opposing targets so they're far more likely to be required to use the spotting dice than uh, tanks that uh, and guns that have better sights, better optics, more crew, uh, etc. And um, the the benefit of uh, superior troop grades is one of two things: the top two troop grade, uh, which is classed as veteran, they actually do shoot better. So you're yeah. far more likely to get hits with the veteran uh, category. But the real benefit of uh, training in combat is how quickly you recover from fire. So, yep. a, um, uh, for instance, a, a green or a regular unit will take fire, uh, as would, say, a, a confident unit or maybe your paratroopers or guards. If anyone takes fire, their instant reaction most of the time, uh, other than being hit, is to get down so their reaction is the same uh, and maybe they take shock but the advantage of better quality troops is they can their chance of removing shock and therefore getting going again and being able to put down uh, better firepower is the fact that they can rally off that shock quicker okay that's interesting because in a way what you what you've done the same with the the same with the spotting dice you've almost looked at the way wargames rules are constructed and stood them slightly on their head 
in as much as rather than saying let's have a spot roll and then fire you're saying well let's just fire and because you have no as a battalion commander you have no command over you have no control over how well that platoon over on your right flank is going to fire all you're doing then is is seeing how effectively the troops on the ground are, are seeing things so you're kind of taking it from a, a different perspective and here the perspective is not the uh, impact of uh, of the firing so that keeps the firing mechanism very very simple yeah but yeah. it then just means that better troops can rally more effectively and consequently will outperform troops of less lesser quality rather yeah. than doing it the other way around which i find as a game designer is quite interesting and quite refreshing yeah. that somebody's prepared to look at that and, and and rather than following um you know the 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 way it's always been done because it's always been done that way you're actually simplifying the process by taking a slightly different viewpoint so i really like the fact that uh, it means that better quality troops are uh, uh, better able to get their proverbial together and yes. get going again. Talk me through how uh, combat patrols work because I believe I can uh, shoot at them, uh, yes, but they can't they, shoot at me. That's correct. So if you uh, imagine what what is a combat patrol? Well, it's a small recon team. Yeah, uh, their objective is not to engage the enemy in a firefight. Their objective is to get to point A and do their job, which is to bring up um, the, the rest of the platoon or a, a gun or, or whatever. So, so as, we've, as we've touched the, on, it's important for me when I see my enemy pushing forward with combat patrols to try and counter that because otherwise all of a sudden yeah. a whole company of infantry turned up in the week <laughs> so, so how do i combat those how do i how do i yeah so the way to combat mm. combat patrols mm. is you've got two methods you can either um shoot them mm. or you can use your reconnaissance units to remove them yeah uh, now a reconnaissance unit just simply uses a, a basic reconnection against combat patrols and if they're successful the combat patrol is removed so you could see that's two ways isn't it it's either been spooked by the recon unit or maybe the recon units just put a few rounds down and they've legged it um and the same with um infantry you can do that um classic recon by fire to use an americanism mm. uh, so an ordinary infantry platoon could choose to fire mm. at a combat patrol if they fail a morale test they are removed from play and placed back in the owning players reserves right okay so that effectively is you are driving off an enemy patrol with fire yeah. and that, yeah. and that is closing down that avenue so the enemy reconnaissance patrol will go back and say i've wrecked that area and i got a load of <laughs> yes. thrown at me so we're not going to deploy there so you're, you're driving them off and you are able to counter them but of course that's that's taking up your command points, isn't it? That's taking up your commanders. Yeah, there's a, there's, yeah, there's a tactical decision there for the player. Yeah. Do you, con do you if you've got um, targets such as infantry and guns that are up and engaging you, and you've got combat patrols, yeah. where do you want to put down your fire? I mean, if you've got enough orders, <laughs> then you might be lucky enough to engage both targets mm. or mo a multiplicity of targets and combat patrols. But otherwise, you as the commander need to make the choice which one is more important or presents the greatest threat perhaps in the future turns. Because a combat patrol may not be a threat now, but maybe in the next turn or the turn after, yeah. it could most certainly be a threat. Okay, now, uh, indirect fire. Um, oh, yes. you've, you've got two types effectively, haven't you? You've got artillery fire and you've got mortars. Uh, yeah, you got, you got your your integral battalion mortars, but you've also got uh, artillery fire, which can come up from um, you know brigade, division, corps, whatever. Um, yeah. And how do you go about how do you go about calling for that? How do you go about getting uh, yeah, either so, of those fire types? Yeah. So let's, let's start with more of you. Um, uh, take battalion mortars first. They are your organic. Mm -hmm. Um, indirect fire element for the battalion yeah so they're always available uh, to you you simply put orders in either as the it, again it doesn't matter as the play company commander can call them in or battalion commander right uh, nominate your target 
and then engage that target with fire. Um, obviously, some of the, the, the better armies or the more flexible armies in terms of uh, forward observers and their use will, will indicate the fact that they, they will have a multiplicity of units which to spot with. Right. So you could use your forward observer in some armies. Mm. In other armies, you could use a company commander. Uh, in other armies, you could use a reconnaissance unit. So the, the basically the, the more artillery uh, orientated your army is uh, on the ground and it's, it's linked to uh, the infantry on the ground will have a better response. So that's basically mortars. You just bring them in and, and they, they open up. You're either zeroed in, which means the rounds are pretty much on target, or you're laying in harassing fire, which means the rounds are on target, but they're, they're over a much wider area or spread. So there's no need to worry about um, deviation, deviation dices or, or, or anything right. like that. Yeah. So they're, 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 they're either doing their job very effectively or they're doing their job but it's not as effective as it could be. So we're not talking about having to walk your artillery onto the target. We're talking about that's assumed to be happening. So what you're focusing yeah. on, Dave, is effect rather than cause. Uh, and, yes. in, and in game terms, when you're looking at the commander at battalion level, he doesn't want to know the um, micro specifics of what the forward, observing, uh, forward observation officer is doing. What he wants to know is what effect am I getting? And that's, we're not focused in on the level of detail that we would get in chain of command, for example. And artillery, I'm presuming artillery has got a fairly similar mechanism. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, um, you can get various yeah, it, levels of artillery it's not, support. It's not, yeah, yeah. Uh, imagine artillery uh, support is generally uh, goes via battalion HQ. So if you could put the situation, isn't it? The player or the battalion uh, commander or his staff are, are on the line uh, requesting artillery support. So you can request it from uh, what's termed as regimental level, which basically means that's probably attached to your brigade or your regiment, and you've got a reasonable chance of uh, calling that in. Or you can go up to division and try getting through to div and speaking to some uh, colonel or brigade of artillery and request some big stuff. Now, as you would expect, the chances of getting that are, are less. So basically, the player is making another decision. What does he want? And what's his likelihood of getting it? OK, so what we can say is you can, you can, you can get up and you can ask for Agra or whatever, but the chances of you getting it is much reduced. Whereas if you decide <laughs> you want to get in your regimental uh, 25 pounders, you, you're much more likely to, to get the right response, but it probably it won't be as impressive with all the fireworks and bells and whistles. So that is representing yeah. uh, really the decisions that would be, again, that would be being made at, at um, battalion level. Uh, it's not the minutiae, it's not the cause, it's the effect that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, um, we've talked about infantry fire, we've talked about anti-tank fire and tank fire, uh, we've talked about indirect fire. Um, can we talk about close combat? How, how, yeah. What close combat options do we have? Um, well, there's basically uh, three. You can have infantry close combat that are engaging infantry and guns, yeah. uh, and then you can have tank close combat, which will either be AFVs uh, attempting to do an overrun of infantry and guns or infantry um, basically tank hunting. Okay. Uh, and how would, uh, if, I, if I were to assault you, your infantry platoon with my infantry platoon, how would we actually work that out? What's the basis there? Um, so the basis is you would, as the attacking player, declare an assault hmm. and you can do uh, one of two things. You can either put fire down and then go, mm -hmm. or you can do a uh, ignore putting fire down and just do a rapid move uh, towards the target. Um, there's obviously advantages and disadvantages of doing either of those. Right. If you, the defender, as long as he's got orders uh, in hand, which we would expect that nine times out of ten, or if not more, he will, he will be able to react fire as you come towards him. 
So if you haven't uh, softened the target or suppressed the target, and then you attempt to leap across the ground in a kind of bayonet charge without putting any fire down, you could probably expect that not only are you going to take shock as you close uh, with the enemy, you're far more likely to take losses because you're already carrying shock. Yeah. Whereas the defender were fresh, uh, they would not. So it's the uh, usual classic tactic is put fire down with a fire platoon or a supporting fire unit, suppress the target and then go in or tap from the flank. But right. try to avoid running at them across the open from the front because that's uh, that's unpleasant. Yeah. Um, and the same with uh, tanks. In a way, what I'd I'd always read from various accounts and, and and came into my mind was that tanks were actually pretty worried about advancing against infantry in any kind of cover or who they couldn't see, mm -hmm. and that. Wouldn't matter if you're a Sherman in Normandy or even, you know, your T-35 rumbling up through Russia, uh, despite the fact it's probably slightly less dense terrain. The fear of having infantrymen crawl over your all over your tank and drop unpleasant things either uh, into your turret or, or in, onto your engine deck uh, was pretty much paramount. So, again, tanks are very good at overrunning infantry who are suppressed in the open. Right. Soon as those infantry are in cover, then the situation changes and, and the player, and I think quite rightly, should be very worried about tanks trying to engage infantry in built up areas or cover or woods with tanks. And what you tend to get and which is reason, quite pleasing in certain situations, you'll have two players playing a game. They're both on the same side. One is commanding the tanks and one is commanding the infantry. And the infantry player is saying to the tank commander, you get your tanks forward up and sort that infantry out. Whereas the tank commander is then saying, I'm not sending my tanks in to get massacred by Panzerfaust and say, you've got to clear the infantry out before I advance with my tanks. All right. So that's uh, not not exactly unrepresentative of reality. That very much, yes. very much a conversation we uh, we see uh, happening in many many accounts of uh, of the war. Okay, now a um, little bit about um, uh, the difference in terms of firing between um, uh, different nationalities. Is there yeah. is there a difference in there between the, the way troops and different nationalities fire? Do they have national characteristics? Yeah, and without uh, going into too much uh, detail on it, what I tried to do was obviously uh, I didn't want a vanilla battalion so that every battalion was the same and there was no differences. So what I tried to do was to reflect in usually uh, three or four uh, kind of unique characteristics, what, how those battalions behaved either tactically or, or in the command situation. Um, so uh, just to give one example, which I think we've touched on, is the German training characteristic for a German battalion is, as you probably expect, the rate of fire. Mm -hmm. So to take into account their um, MG34s, MG42s, and their superior rate of fire, they have an enhanced uh, firing characteristic. Right. So, and, and it's even, and it's enhanced further with Panzer Grenadiers. As obviously you'll know, there's a lot more machine guns in a Panzer Grenadier platoon. Right. Hence, they have more firepower. The British uh, have something else. Their ability to lay smoke with their light mortars was right. uh, different to other armies and they used that uh, in a particular manner. So they have that advantage. Americans have an advantage, and the Russians have, uh, well, some disadvantages and some advantages. So we're seeing, you know, things like the quality of the battalion, their doctrine, uh, in yeah. terms of uh, the, the way they uh, the way they can call upon the support from their assets, 
and yeah. we're looking at the, the, the national characteristics of the troops, all allowing you to tweak the different formations so they have a different feel and they behave in yeah. a manner which is so, pertinent to the, to the way they would behave historically. And of course, if you want to, uh, if you want to adjust that and create your own um, ideas, you've got your own idea of, let's say, Osttruppen mm. or whatever, you could quite easily roll that out and, and create lists for those forces. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I think once uh, 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 people see um, the battalion uh, list and, and battalion characteristics, they'll very quickly understand where it's coming in from. And if they wanted to add an additional characteristic for a particular formation, then that would be very easy to do. But yes, it basically, um, they all fight in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. You will find that an American battalion uh, therefore fights quite differently to a German battalion or to a British one or a Russian one. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm sure we'll see that play out once uh, you're pushing on with your games on the table and that will become very obvious there. So um, what I really want to know, Dave, because this is probably the most important thing to me when I'm playing a game is how do I win? <laughs> What's the what's what's the what, what, what do I need to do to defeat my opponent? <laughs> there are uh, there are two basic ways to win a game. Either you, if you're playing a uh, a set scenario or a historical scenario, you can win by capturing your objectives or whatever it is you've chosen to set. Yeah. But in the basic uh, game, you can also not only win by capturing objectives, but win by defeating the opponent through attrition right. and that is summed up with that handy um uh, what's it acronym or phrase uh foobars right so and um, what that is is essentially that every set number of casualties you take uh on your battalion mm -hmm. you'll receive what's uh oddly uh, enough termed as a foobar marker right and what that does is that removes one dice from your battalion O group dice rolls. Okay, so my ability to command my battalion is reduced by yeah. uh, by removing those dice due to the levels of yeah. casualties. And the more, hmm. Yeah, and the more losses you take, uh, so if you had a second food bar marker, you'd lose two dice, you have a third, you'd lose three, etc. cetera. Um, there was a slight twist in that tale in that, as a battalion commander, you have the option to ignore your food bar markers and roll all of the dice, your basic uh, original hand. Um, however, that does bring with it certain, um, how shall I say, detriments. So if it goes wrong, it could go very badly wrong for you. So there's a choice for the battalion commander. Mm -hmm. Does he... Uh, exercise decide to right push his company commanders and his units for into uh, a, a concerted effort and overrides or ignores those food bars and therefore takes all his dice or does he say no i'm prepared to accept the casualty rate as it is the slight reduction in command uh, and we'll crack on with say only eight dice or seven dice so there's that decision to be made um every turn once you start taking losses from from uh, from our playing games as you know we went through the playtest process Dave. i believe that each foobar counts as a roll of one doesn't it so uh, yeah. you already start off with the hand loaded against you and consequently that could that could see you end up with the negative effects of companies becoming hesitant and, yeah. and so forth so you it's it's a real a ballsy choice to to override <laughs> the Pumars and say right we I've, but at this moment in time I haven't got the choice I've got yeah, to maximize my command so it, the, it yeah um, absolutely, absolutely there might be that there's, there's going to come those situations where you think right this turn this turn I need as many orders as I've got there's an opportunity to break through to seize that objective and I'm going for it but of course uh, as you say you each one you were each food bar mark you override gives you an additional one in your hand yeah so if it all goes wrong and the very company you want to you're expecting to push forward and make that breakthrough goes hesitant well then you've paid the paid the price for uh, 
for trying to push your battalion too far. Okay, interesting. But once again, we're seeing an interesting command decision being made there, aren't we? Okay, fabulous. Well, um, that's, that's great, Dave. I think what we've done there is we've got a really good view of everything that I wanted to discuss this time, which is, you know, understanding how the nitty gritty aspects of the rules work. And I think we've covered that uh, very well. But it's all well and good us sitting here chatting about it. Um, but I think the, uh, the, the proof of the pudding is going to be in uh, uh, me asking you to go away and to, uh, to play this through with Christopher on the tabletop. And obviously you've got our Eastern Front game set up there and ready to go. So thank you, Dave. And thank you, everybody else for listening. Uh, we'll be back to you very soon with uh, that video uh, doing exactly what we've been talking about. So thank you once again and good night. Mm -hmm.